I was staring at the ceiling all night thinking about thinking about this cocktail. Why don't you, why you just take the, take the night off? You got your friend over there with the beard. Have him uh, pour the drinks tonight. Yes, the beard, the beard. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right, I'm really excited about this one. Uh, go for it. Take it away. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out on a, on a or staying in on a Tuesday night. This is our, this is our, last, this is our last class, guys. This is, our, this is the last week of the Tiki, the Freaky Tiki seminar and it's uh, it's a miracle that's happening because I'm, I'm actually coming at you live from meredith new hampshire i'm, I'm at the, i'm at lake winnipesaukee I'm staying with my in-laws um my wife and i wanted to get away for a little bit and i think among what we'll be talking about today um are the lessons we all need to learn when, when making cocktails in a scary new place i mean i don't i don't have access to a whole lot of ice or the right or the glassware I'm, i have i got like an ice bucket over here I, I don't have we're making it work but thank god i have this gnome the, the gnome the gnome's on on duty here we're in good shape uh this is our bedroom and it's just uh we're making it work it's it's uh it's super important i think to be able to it's, it's the sign of a good chef to be able to work in any kitchen you look in all the drawers, you get a feeling for the space. And the same way when it comes to cocktails, when, you, when people know you as someone who makes cocktails, you have to learn how to adapt to your surroundings. And yeah, this is certainly one of them, um, all gnomes aside. So uh, I just want to thank everybody for else for, for, for coming here. This is, um, you know, we've been, we've been discussing the rise and fall and rise of Tiki. We've covered the colonialist history of rum, the the rose-colored history of Polynesian pop, and the saccharine sweet history of disco drinks. And tonight we're going to wrap up this series by discovering the modern day innovations that have made their way into this category and discuss whether cultural appropriation that is inherent throughout Tiki's sort of environment is, uh, is avoidable for the future. And that's, that's going to be a tougher answer a question to answer but we're going to get into it so first the first part you know with, with respect to innovation what does modern tiki look like you know so like as a as a bartender when i was confronted with a classic or vintage cocktail recipe you know there are a few ways that you can modernize that drink for for modern consumers you know you could tweak the ratios that's a common one uh, for example the jungle bird we made the other week uh, originally called for four ounces of pineapple juice, which and we only called for one and a half. That drink is a nightmare with four ounces of pineapple juice, but it was also made during a time when people were, they were just more juicy. You know, the, the palate was sweeter and it was about the tropical thing. And, you know, it was, it was frankly, it was a drink that was made to appeal to women who didn't want to drink as much hard alcohol. Um, we've learned a lot of lessons since then and we can still make ratios work for us today once you decipher what the hell a gill or a half glass is. Beyond that, you know, you can, you can actually keep the ratios and just make discrete substitutions. So when we made the planter's punch, instead of using grenadine as our sugar, we used passion fruit syrup, which was, gives you an improvement in flavor and balance due to its it's, uh, you know, it's baked in acidity. But if you don't want to tweak things that's on that small level, you could just add new modern ingredients, ingredients that we didn't have back even in the 70s when Trader Vic was still making things. So that's like, we're talking about mostly like Amari, right? So you're putting Campari in your Mai Tais, you're putting uh, Chinar in your Pina Coladas or something. And, uh, and last, of course, you can use modern cocktail techniques to showcase classic flavors in new ways. The same way that, you know, people have been cooking steaks forever, but now that we have sous vide, we can make a steak in a way that we, we weren't able to years ago. Is it a better steak? It's, that's up to you to decide, but we can make modern cocktails by clarifying juices or carbonating like coconut syrups. We can do all this cool stuff. Um, for example, like I could make you a stirred daiquiri by uh, instead of using fresh lime juice that needs to be shaken, 
I could use, um, you know, lime hydrosol, which, you know, gives me the, the essence of lime juice. And I could, uh, I can mix it with acid phosphate, which uh, it can be stirred. It's again, it's nothing that has to be, um, is it, you know, sort of all mixed up together and it gives you the acidity you want. You can make a stirred daiquiri that way. It's a really interesting concept. But the most important question to ask when using modern liqueurs and techniques and tweaking the things and substituting things and playing Mr. Potato Head is, are you improving this cocktail or are you just making it different? It's, a, it's an important question to ask. So you can make the argument that tiki innovation languished under a generation of bartenders that are mixing these drinks without genuine recipes. But in fact, thankfully, the current landscape is proof that we've made up for lost time. I look at the, like the go-to tiki bars in America, at least. I'll, I'll keep it to the country that I know really well. Uh, Three Dots in a Dash, uh, Smuggler's Cove, Shore Leave, Lost Lake. These are all examples of modern tiki bars that pay equal respect to the past and present by, um, you know, uh, a tip of the cap by making, you know, cocktails that have secret ingredients, you know, that you'll never actually know the whole recipe. Uh, by introducing nut-free orgeats so everyone can have a Mai Tai or, or a zombie for the first time. Um, by being less tiki and more tropical. Um, certainly giving you the escape that people look for, but without the maybe worrying about cultural appropriation, which we'll get into in a second. But people, you know, it's interesting to think, you know, what the future of Tiki is. You, if you saw the title of this class, it, it, we go back to the, seven, the 17th century, but the future of Tiki might actually be a little more questionable, a little more muddy, it's more of a mixed bag. So one example of like, some really positive things to happen uh, in, the, in the modern, sustainable, um, sensitive to culture world when, when talking about tiki is, uh, is trash tiki. These guys are awesome. Uh, trash tiki is this anti-waste punk pop-up group that was started in 2016 by bartenders named Kelsey Ramage and Ian Griffiths. And their motto is, quote, drink like you give a fuck, which is perfect. I mean, the, the, environment, the environmental impact of juice-heavy cocktails is something that's really discussed, rarely discussed in, in, in modern craft cocktail making. I mean, you, whenever uh, I was working at, um, like, Russell House Tavern in, in Cambridge, in Hard Square. Every other day, I would break down an entire box of limes, slicing them all in half and then pressing the, pressing the juice out of them with a tower juicer. And I'd run through, a t I, I, I'd run through my, my half my weight in limes. And then I would immediately throw all those spent lime halves into the trash. It's like, I got what I needed, I got the juice out. And that's like, it's just such a, it, 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 trash tiki so does done such a great job of pointing out what we take for granted. Uh, they've been incredibly innovative by salvaging what is usually thrown away. Some of the examples are um, a sour mix made out of apple pulp. So like the cores of apples and the skins of apples uh, that you break down with malic acid and sugar. Uh, watermelon rind cordials, right? So if you're, if you're making a watermelon juice, you can take all the cordials and mix it up and uh, macerate like you would an oil saccharum with sugar. And it's a stunning flavor, something that I really, really enjoy. Um, yeah, well said, Phil. Ryan's do fly when you're having fun. There's um, avocado pits, the, thing, the things we just, we just trash immediately. They make orja out of avocado pits. You know, and these are all ideas that are, I think, in my opinion, are way more relevant today than switching from plastic straws to metal straws. It's still a great step, obviously, but um, just way more way more, ob it's just almost obvious now that I think about it. Uh, that's, the, that's the stuff that any of us can just look up a recipe and start saving and, and start limiting our carbon footprint when we're making these drinks. But here's, a, here's the wild side. Here's the, the extreme side of trash tiki. Uh, if you work in a bar, you'll, you'll know that, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of drinks come back to you with a little bit of juice left in there. 
right? Uh, some beers are not finished, some wines are not finished, someone didn't finish all of their cocktail. It happens, maybe they're, they're a couple deep, or maybe they just, uh, they got distracted, it's, it's fine, it, gets, it lands back on your bar, maybe it's a wrong order. And one bar in particular was working in tandem with Trash Tiki to take all of these odd ends, like all the, the, the dregs, of these mostly finished cocktails and pour them into, uh, into basically a, a, a barrel, just a steel barrel, a drum. Uh, if, you, if you watch Breaking Bad, just imagine the drums that they used to, to make all their drugs. And at the end of a month, when they, when they filled up an entire, you know, half barrel drum of dregs of cocktails, they'd bring it to a local distillery, redistill it, so all the bacteria is gone. It's, it's made healthy again. You, and you end up with a neutral spirit from all, these, all the cocktail leftovers that were going to be dumped down the drain that would otherwise be unhealthy to consume and then left to rest in stainless steel to soften over time and to be used to make cocktails again. It, it feels gross thinking about it. And this is, this is obviously very extreme on the scale of saving waste. But it's really important to think about how much we dump in the trash. Um, and it shows a willingness to be really disruptive when, when, when reusing. When we talk about recycling, people, people forget about reuse. Reuse comes before recycle. If you can reuse something, if you can repair something, that, that is much more valuable than having to spend, expend energy into making something new. So... Uh, my hat's off to Trash Tiki. They are um, really part of the future of Tiki, um, I think, in a positive way. But to go to the cultural side of things, um, the side of things that it's, it is harder for us to discuss, frankly. You know, it, it's, it's almost, it's, it's just a, it's a cliche now at this point, having a, having a, a Northeastern white dude um, talking about problems that affect people, uh, you know, people of color and, uh, and indigenous folks from other countries. So I'm going to try and make my arguments that, that are coming up here um, by using as many quotes from folks that actually um, have the, the correct heritage. So that said, you know, we discussed a little bit the problem of cultural erasure when we were covering the history of colonialism in, in the earliest rum producing countries. But but what we're going to talk about today is the more insidious form of neocolonialism that exists in every tiki bar across the country, which is cultural preparation. Remember, like every, no, almost every drink on the menus of Don the Beachcomber and Trader Vic's are American inventions. Hell, like even, even the daiquiri is American. It was invented by a dude named Jennings Co uh, Cox, who was an engineer. And we're just getting shwasted in Cuba and happened to be using Cuban rum for it. We think of it as a Cuban drink. It's named after a Cuban beach, but an American made it. And even though that drink in some form or another was very popular before, it was called the daiquiri. The daiquiri is what we call today. Remember, we call, we call Indians, Indians still. They, I mean, the, the, native, the Native American... Uh, community has has sort of signed off on being called Indians, but we 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 generally call them the wrong thing. The 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 mistake of Christopher Columbus years ago. It's just kind of funny to think about. Again, it's just, it's a way of, of thinking about our um our language and how that how that uh, informs how we drink, how we interact with what we eat. And speaking of eating, um, a hero of mine. And I don't have many. I, I try to be as cynical as possible and I think of, of people to look up to, but Anthony Bourdain, um, who passed away, uh, he, he uh, sadly, tragically killed himself at 61 a few years ago. Um, his influence on me as someone who grew up in, in kitchens, or at least I, my adolescence was spent in kitchens, he was really important to me. And um, a, a comedian and writer named Jenny Yang sent out a few tweets um, sort of to talk about his death and, and the importance, the influence he had on, on food, especially in countries that we don't talk about. Uh, and it went viral. And this is, this is a little bit of what she had to say about Anthony Bourdain. I think it's actually, it keys in really well to what we're talking about. Saying, quote, 
Bourdain was different because he was a white guy with a platform who used his storytelling gifts to highlight communities most Americans would never think twice about. He wasn't perfect, but Bourdain used his power to support the stories of immigrants and undocumented workers. He was someone trying to represent our culture with respect and dignity. A prominent white ally who did his best to appreciate and not appropriate. What he said was, was, it wasn't revolutionary to us. He simply said what we've been saying all along, every day and twice on Sunday, but he had the persona and pedigree to be heard, end quote. And I think, you know, I, the best I can do to be, I, I certainly don't have the persona nor the pedigree uh, to stack up to Bourdain, and that's not my intent either. Um, but I do think we can all do a great job of under, a better understanding uh, the context behind these drinks. There's another, another person I want, I want to highlight who, um, his name is, is Kalua Korea, who is, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's a curator at the Smithsonian's um, Asian Pacific Icelander Center. And if you didn't know that the Smithsonian had an Asian Pacific Icelander, um, I Islander Center, then, you know, you're, you're, you're in good company. And he had this perspective to add. He said, quote, with tiki, you know, what you're looking at, the carvings are either representations of gods or the representations of ancestors. So if we were to put that in context that Americans would better understand, it'd be like going to a Christian themed bar with drinks served in glasses shaped like the Virgin Mary, end quote, which is... It's a really, it's a really nice quote, and it's, 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 it makes you laugh um, thinking about the idea. It would seem silly. Putting a straw in the Virgin Mary is, it's hilarious to me, and I, I don't mean that um, disrespectfully. It just, it seems um, completely incongruous to, to, to how we would respect what, what this country was built on, the respect of other people's cultures and religions, and it just, it seems just a little, a little rough. But the reason why the tiki iconography is so powerfully evocative is because it wasn't invented. These are real stories being uh, commodified for our drinking pleasure. So I and just like just to, and just to check in, you know, I, I have I have tiki mugs. I love the aesthetic. I I drink them all the time. I'm having a blast teaching this class. If if there's a if you're if there are eight, if there are like seventy eight people in a tiki bar in Chicago having the time of their lives in there, but two folks that are visiting from Bora Bora feel uncomfortable and invalidated, that doesn't mean that the bar has to close, but it does suggest that we have a lot more to learn from each other. I'm not here to also I, I I'm I'm not equipped to tell us how to how to fix tiki. Uh, I do know that I think it, it shouldn't be up entirely to us. It brings up the question of like uh, the, the team, the NFL team formerly known as the Washington Redskins. Do you completely disavow yourself from the, um, from the, the native community and create a new name like the Washington Red Wolves, which has been floated a few times? Or do you engage that community? Do you engage the local tribes and ask how to have a period, how to have a discussion of cultural exchange instead of cultural appropriation? Do we allow them to, to help us tell the story? You know, do you have a moment where before every game you, uh, you discuss what was on this land um, before we were, you know? And some of this might sound ultra liberal to some folks, and and you know it's not my it's not my place to to be a political figure, only to lend a bit of context against what we're drinking, because these stories we're telling are are absolutely useless and hollow if we don't understand the people behind them, and if we don't understand the fact that these folks, um, the Pacific peoples that that um, for whom we have to thank for this this texture that we're lending to these lovely drinks. They have a lot of bigger problems to deal with on their plate, like for like the fact that climate change might um, might knock out their whole island in 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. So it, it's uh, this is a pretty small issue to talk about, but it's one that should be talked about more. One really cool thing that's 
that's um, in, in a reaction to how, how to fix appropriation. I think you guys will love this. It's like, a, it's, it's kind of a badass idea. Um, last summer, uh, Chucky Tom and Austin Hartman founded a, a um, sort of an aesthetic, a pop again called Doom Tiki, which is a fundraising, uh, non-appropriative pop-up that likes to bring attention to a lot of the problematic issues while benefiting different cultures and communities that are still dealing with the after effects of colonization. Um, and and uh, Tom said, has this to say, saying, quote, part of the reason that we like to cause problems by using satanic, uh, satanic iconography in Doom Tiki and, and are kind of disrespecting your religious iconography is because we want to provoke people into actually thinking about what is problematic, end quote. So imagine, imagine you wanting like the best uh, zombie or Mai Tai in Brooklyn, and, but instead of getting ukulele and flower girls, you get death metal and tattoos. And the drinks are still dope, by the way. Like they're still incredible, but they're served in like, you know, goat skulls and they have pentagrams on them, you know, it's, but, and the bartenders are cuddly and lovely and the hospitality is there. No one's gruff, but they, it's a different texture. I think, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm really, I really want to make it clear to you guys because I think we're all, we're, not, we're all pretty close here. I'm not trying to have this holier than thou uh, or virtue signaling aspect of this part of the class. I just, what I want us to do what I ask us to do is, um, is to consider how much of our enjoyment of these drinks is what's in the glass and what's outside of it. And to remember that no matter how far that these new cocktails we, we make might stray from the core repertoire of tiki drinks, that they remain true to the most important ingredient in tiki, which is escape. So I ask you, I challenge you, wherever you go, in this world, as soon as it's safe to go. Don't go alone. And to quote Anthony Bourdain, drink like a local. I actually, uh, I'm, even though I'm not local, I'm not in New York right now, uh, I'm usually local to a bar where uh, a man named Giuseppe Gonzalez used to work. And you'll, you might remember the name as he's the person who retrofitted uh, the Jungle Bird cocktail to use not a dark Jamaican rum, but a blackstrap rum, right? Totally different flavor, right? Uh, this dude is also the person who invented the drink we're making tonight, which I am so excited for you guys to try out, called the Trinidad Sour. Basically, um, to understand why the hell this drink exists, you have to understand what was happening in 2008. 2008 was, it was a Cocktail culture was still a subculture of a subculture. It was, it was fighting against their parents. It was, we don't want blue Hawaiians anymore, dad. You know, we were making things super bitter and, and super, everything was an acquired taste. Everything was challenging. And what's more challenging than using a full ounce of a normally non-potable bitter as the base of your cocktail, right? Uh, there are potable bitters like Chinar, Fernet, Campari, and then there are non-potable bitters like Angostura, Jerry Thomas, Decanter bitters, orange bitters, etc. Things that you use in dashes, not in ounces. But uh, Giuseppe wanted us to all really show off like what we can do here with this really, like frankly, this lovely, lovely spirit. If you look at the bottle, it actually tells you it's 44.7% alcohol. This is stronger than most bourbons in the market, okay? Like this, this is, it's got some, it's got some legs. So we're gonna make this drink here. Um, I am, I, again, everything's a little bit different here. I'm not using chilled glassware. I'm, I'm in the west wing of the house. But we're gonna start breaking this, this, uh, this drink down. And uh, we're gonna be using rye whiskey instead. Now, Giuseppe wanted this drink to, to use Angostura as the base, but he also, when he started leaning into this tropical or tiki flavor profile using the Orgeat, um, he thought it'd be really cool to make this drink not with rum, but with a rye whiskey using the spice to, to blend in with the uh, Angostura and to make sure that there's also a little more 
little more strength behind this drink. So all that said, um, I'm going to start, I'm going to start breaking this drink down, baby. I mean, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to start going here. Uh, the, the rye whiskey I'm going to be using, and I know I said to use a, a whiskey if you can, that's at least, um, you know, at least a hundred proof. I'm using some, it's 95, but I'm using a lovely rye whiskey. Masterson's 10 year old rye. If you are not drinking Canadian rye whiskeys of quality, then you are missing out. I'll say that much. Phil, my man, Phil, if you want to throw in the recipe, as I shouted out here, I think I did email it to you, but uh, I'm going to start off with three quarters of an ounce of fresh lemon juice. Uh, that is going to be the lovely, lovely, lovely quality here. And uh, this, let me change my screen here. Oh my goodness. After uh, 0.75 lemon juice, I'm going to use one half ounce of my rye whiskey. I'm a little shy of 100 proof, so I'm going to go with a heavy half ounce right in here. Then I'm going to use one full ounce of my, of my house orgeat, my, my nut-free orgeat. Again, if anyone's looking for a nut-free recipe for orgeat, um, reach out to me via email. I'll, I will send you my secrets. Oh, yeah. And the fun, <laughs> the best part of the night, uh, angster bitters. We're going to throw a whole goddamn ounce into this drink. Uh, oh boy, here we go. So uh, you'll notice that as soon as you take the cap off that there is a, um, there's a ridge on top here. So you can actually, you can, oh boy, you can pop this cap off if you're careful about it. And if you don't mind getting bitters all of your hands, and then you can just pour in one ounce of bitters. I have bitters all over my hands already. Um, I don't know what you guys have been doing. It makes you look cool. It makes you look like, uh, like the kind of person that, that, that works with their hands. Kind of the opposite of me. I, I, uh, whenever I shake someone's hand for the first time, they say, oh my God, have you worked a day in your life? I tell them no. If you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. One ounce. Bangster bitters. Uh, because this is this is um, a drink we're not serving on the rocks, we're serving it up. Uh, we don't need to crack ice, we don't need to crush ice. We're just gonna use whole ice. I'll be using my little ice bin over here. Ah oh, man, my, my in-laws are so posh. Do they have jiggers? No. But do they have ice buckets? Yes. Why? I don't know. I have to ask some questions. They're, they're lovely. They've been so kind. Nice to see family again. Uh, my wife and I, we got our, um, we got tested before we drove up. And it's, it's truly, I think my, this, our, our, our parents are uh, maybe the fourth or fifth people that we've seen since March. So it's nice to have some human contact as, as lovely as you guys all are at home. So, I'm going to throw the tin on top of this. This is a frothy ass drink. So it's going to look crazy when you strain it, when you strain it in here. I do recommend double straining it. Um, I'm not using an egg white in this drink, though it is a sour. Technically, you can certainly use an egg white in here. I'm not doing it. Um, try it next time. I think it's delicious without it. But uh, we're going to, we're going to shake this bad boy up and I think we're going to have a great time here. So get ready. Make sure you test for, um, for spice, for flavor, for body, for texture, all that. This is just, this is not a subtle drink. It should look like this.
not unlike pineapple juice that froths up on you. This will this will get ahead. Um, it will it will have like a it will start to to separate a bit, and it'll show you um, it'll show you what Angostura bitters can do in a glass. If you make this with egg white, it is an entire thing. It, you are not going to have room for dinner. I will tell you that much. But this, I can imagine no better drink to discuss to to, to land on for the the last tiki drink. We've talked about so much. We talked about you know what rum was, how it started, how it was consumed, by whom why we mixed it, how we mixed it. We created whole new worlds, we thought, with, with these drinks in mind and inspired generations to, to find new means of escape. We've taken these rules and threw them out the window and forgot how to make drinks for a while and thought that martinis were just shaken vodka for a few years. And then we got to where we are today, where we're just throwing all kinds of crazy ass shit into a cocktail shaker, baby. Are you crazy? This is an unreal drink. This drink shouldn't exist, but it does. And you now know about it. And that's what's important. Um, we're going to open up to questions soon, but I first just, I just wanted to give a quick cheers to everybody. And I love you all and I hope you're staying safe and healthy with your families. Soupy twist. That doesn't suck. Phil! Phil! <laughs> oh, man. I'm jealous. I, 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 I was going to make the cocktail today. And I have the lemons. I've got, I've got all the mixins, and I've got like a million of rice to choose from. I did not get Orjot. What's wrong with me? <sighs> Nothing's but, wrong with uh, you. You are, you are perfect. You and Wilson are lovely folks. This Wilson. Is, uh, Wilson, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ah. Ah. Uh, this drink. Oh man. Uh, you'll know because I mean, you know, Phil. I mean, you you've been you've been in the business. You've been around. You know that there is like this this um like <laughs> this desire for everything dark, bitter, brown, and stirred. For a long time, you went to any any cocktail bar from 2006 through 2012. If you didn't have two drinks that were all just whiskey and bitters, <laughs> then you were you were not in. You were not cool. You were not with it. If you didn't have the cocktail book Beta Cocktails by the folks that opened up Cure in New Orleans, you were a basic ass bitch making making cosmos and skinny margaritas. So yeah. this is this is a drink of its time. But it is an, it's, it's not necessarily a tiki drink, but it is informed by tiki. And that's what's super, super important. It's, it's, the, it's all the good parts. It's, the, it's not stealing the cultural parts. It was, this one was made with intent for just being a good drink. And honestly, that's what most tiki drinks were. It's just that, as we learned, that they, were, they tried to play up in like, like a Disneyland kind of thing. And just when you get past that, you just look at the drink itself. There's so many good things. And I was honestly not expecting whiskey to end up anywhere in this lineup when you, when you, when you brought this out. Like, I, that, was, that was a surprise. It was, meant to be, uh, it was meant to be a bit of a surprise. I mean, we have, we have, uh, we have Cotton Reed still here. I was sipping a little Cotton Reed before I, went, I started making this drink. And we have them to thank for this series. But I think it's also important, as important as it is to, to, to develop the rules and regulations of a, of, a, um, of a cocktail subculture, it's important to break those rules whenever possible. And to the benefit of all of us to learn from it, it's, um, yeah, rye whiskey does really well in this. Like rum, I've made this drink with rum and it is a good drink, but it is not a great drink. I and mean, that's, not, that's not due to the brand of rum you have. It's due to the fact that this doesn't have the spice that you need in this drink. Um, I saw that um, Adina is asking about how much so much volume. I think it's a, a trick of the, of the, uh, of the camera here. If, this, is, this is my jigger that is three ounces filled to the top. And that's how big it is. So this is still uh, just a bit big. 
yeah, it, just, I, I know it, look, it doesn't look like much. I don't have a banana for scale. I can't help people out, but I, I, I <laughs> trust me, there's nothing, there's no sneaky uh, secret compartment in my shaper tin. Well said for scale. <laughs> um, Nick, but, uh, is, Nick, before we get into the oh, rest yeah. of the questions, Phil, um, Nick is reminding me to give everybody a shout out to our bad boys over at Cotton and Reed. Uh, tomorrow, we are having a live show, a live interview with Reed Walker, one of the founders of this lovely distillery. So even though we're not mixing with him this week, we can still hang out with him and you can ask him questions about, um, about rum, specifically, you know, why is rum such an incredible spirit to drink? Um, if, if you're coming from a whiskey background, uh, why do whiskey drinkers all drink rums in secret? Uh, what kind of drinks can you make with it? Um, the, the the technical sides of it from distilling, from fermentation, we can geek out over it. But it'll be me and I think Nick and Phil talking to uh, talking to Reed tomorrow at six p.m. Eastern Standard, and it's going to be a blast. So um, no need to sign up or anything. Just go to our Facebook page, and uh, and it'll be up there. But uh, and and also just you know, if you have any questions again, uh, and you can't make it for that send them to us in advance and we'll ask them so you can watch the video later. It'll be posted on our Facebook page. And th th there could be some very interesting questions, by the way, if you're into chemistry, um, the Reed and uh, Walker are both very smart people. Work for NASA. They work so, for NASA, dog. Work for NASA. <laughs> NASA. So, big brain, big brain mothers. Oh yeah. Oh, let's uh, let's get let's dive into some of these uh, questions. Um, over at Harvard, they're asking, "What is the right glass for this drink?" So yeah, I mean, um, we discussed this briefly in our cocktail um, challenge course, which is like, "What? Why do you use whatever glass I use?" When I when we may, we may hit a highball, it has to be in a long drink because you need to fit all the soda, and he had chilled the glass beforehand because you want to put a cold drink into a cold glass. When we made a Sazerac. We didn't put it in a glass like this. We put it in a like a like a tumbler, like a your 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 average. We put it in a rocks glass. Yeah. But we didn't put any ice in it because we wanted to stay chill. But we also wanted the rest of the room that was coated with absinthe to allow to add to the aroma of the drink. So the, the before anyone asks, the type of glass you use for for any drink is important. I'm putting this in an up glass, in, in a coupe or a Manhattan style glass, a Nick and Nora, a martini glass, something with a stem, because it's, it's a drink that should be consumed as cold as possible. I think it, it's a, it, it lends a great um, presentation to it. This, these glasses are, are from um, my in-law's wedding. Uh, it's a vintage glass using real onyx. It's a, it's a really beautiful glass. But more than that, it separates the warmth of my hand from the glass. Because if I hold my glass like this, like I would a, a rocks glass, it would warm up the cocktail and that's no good. What Which are you doing? Hold, you can hold it, you can hold it like this, no, no problem. There's a, there's, a, there's a cliche that the lower you hold it in the glass, the cooler you are, the more, the more uh, proper you are. And if you're holding it from the bottom, if you're holding it like this, this is called the Somme hold, short for sommelier hold because you want to show that you are as distant from the glass as possible. And I've seen sommeliers with the pins on their shoulders, literally having drinks of wine like this, you know, ta having conversation just as disconnected from the drink as po It's an afterthought. It's like, excuse me, what? Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Like, what were you saying? Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Yes. Spinoza was definitely a neopantheist. I definitely agree. Of course. Yes. <laughs> or whatever people talk about <laughs> when they're drinking wine. I, I'm, I'm just saying um, it's good to have a stem glass. Don't put this in a bucket. You know what else is good for stem? Tell me. NASA. Oh, shit. <laughs> Capital letters, baby. Pew, pew. Yeah, honestly, you, if if you had if I had to guess where that whole uh, holding it from the bottom thing came from with psalms, it's because if I had to guess, honestly, I don't know. I'm not a psalm um, or or any sort of anthropologist when it comes to psalm sommeliers, but I would I would guess it's because you usually hold a bottle but from the bottom like this because you get the best um, you know angle of of pouring by holding from the bottom of the bottle like that, 
if you hold it from the neck like that, it, it just kind of like pours everywhere. Um, so you sort of train yourself to hold things from the bottom like that. So that, that's what my guess would be. But also, yes, I've seen that the whole hot, holding it behind the arm, like I'm too good for this glass. I, maybe you are, I don't care. Sometimes you are. Marilyn said that the, that the recipe sounded awful. And we trusted us, and it's interesting. That's you know that's that's exactly what I was hoping to uh, to elicit in in uh, in the viewing several is to take a leap of faith and to try a drink that is wacky. This is a weird drink, but it is something you will you will learn from, no doubt. Those are fun, aren't they? Like just things that you that should not mix, but they become amazing. And the only, it's it's like I mean, if you were to ask yourself. Like everybody drinks milk these days, but you have to ask yourself, what was the first person doing? Like, where did you come up with that idea? <laughs> we don't talk like, about like, that guy. That guy, that guy is, you know. Like not, the pathway to getting to somewhere this far from like, like common sense and it's still working out and being amazing. That that's, it's mad scientist work right there. Uh, Steve is asking, um, Stephen, love man. Like I, we've been talking a lot off, offline. He's going to give it a shot with uh, with the overproof rum instead of rye, and he's asking if he can really go wrong. And I would say no, you, you can't go wrong. I mean, I would say that this drink was absolutely um, designed with a purpose, which is to accentuate the the winter spice. When we talked about like what makes tiki drinks tiki, one of the main things we talked about was 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 spice. And you certainly have that in spades with the Angostura you're using. The rum will add a funk. I find that rum and lemon juice aren't always great partners. Um, maybe the drink would be better if you, if you, if you swapped it into, into lime juice, but lime juice is almost too tart, so you could balance it with a little bit of sugar, maybe more orgeat. I'm just saying, try it out. But remember, as you said earlier, Stephen, this is very alcoholic. Uh, bitters, bitters. Uh, no one really thinks of how how alcoholic bitters are because they're only using a couple dashes of them. This is basically almost using a um, you know a ninety proof rye whiskey in addition to a ninety proof rye whiskey in your cocktail. A lot of hooch. There's a lot of hooch in here, dog. Oh shoot, baby. Yeah, you crazy. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a lot. Is um is there any suggested garnish? A twist of lemon peel. This is I'm I'm fairly agnostic when it comes to garnish. I don't think you need to have um, a whole lot going on here because it's so aromatic already. There's so much that it's attacking your nose with. Um if you if you think that this drink is too dry, then a garnish that we might help out is is a couple of brandied cherries on the side so you have a little bit of sugar if you think that it's uh it's too acidic or too sharp and pointy then they, like again doubly so like you want something that that can balance the fat if you think aromatically it's too one note and you're you're bummed out by all the um the baking spices an orange twist would introduce some some sweetness on the nose without adding any sweetness to the cocktail but again, I encourage everyone to, to play around, have fun with it. It does smell like Christmas, Merlin. I mean, it is, this is a drink that transcends seasonality. You can drink this anytime you want. Um, just make sure that you've had a full meal <laughs> before you do it. Um, this, this actually makes me curious because yeah. uh, I had a question uh, that just popped up. Why would you sure. use Angostura as opposed to other bitters? Because uh, what mo most people might not know is that bitters can be in two different categories in terms of what the base of the uh, the bitters is. It can be wine based, can be um, like alcohol based, uh, like like, uh, uh, like yeah, I, uh, like vodka based, basically. All, all um, rain spirit. All, all bitters are not created equal, as you, as you suggest. You know. Um, I think very very common there's if you if you walk into like a Hannaford's or a Stop and Shop and you, and you go into the place where they have all the mixed bullshit and uh, and the powders uh, and like all the sour mixes and all the nightmare stuff, um, hopefully things that we we've grown past, they'll have bitters too. They'll probably have Ango because you know, it's it's what you would expect to find, 
but they probably also have a couple of fees brothers. Um, if you are, uh, if you are a recovering alcoholic or if you are pregnant or if you are on antibiotics and you're trying to avoid all alcohol, bitters are a great way to get flavor into a non-alcoholic cocktail. Um, while still having fun with mixing, um, you can play, you can, you can make these, these drinks for kids. It's, it's not a problem. Specifically though, if you want to be really, really, uh, a purist about it, this does have alcohol in it. Even if we're talking about a 16th of a teaspoon. But if you use Fees Brothers, Fees Brothers is not based in alcohol, it's based in glycerin. So it's, it, it is essentially alcohol free. Um, because of that, it is also less, less, less extracted and less bitter. I find them to be inherently a bit more sweet, though concentrated they may be. I will always choose a non Fees Brothers bitter over its, um, its alcoholic equivalent when I'm making a cocktail for people that can drink alcohol without any worry. That does not mean that these brothers is a bad product. It has a place, but it's about what you're, um, what you want to use. Other non-potable bitters that are easily found that have been used in potable quantities would be um, Peixo. If you look up the book Beta Cocktails, again, it's hard to find. Um, you'll, you'll probably can find it secondhand. There's a, there's a cocktail called the Gun Shop Fizz, which calls for two ounces of Peixo bitters. There are drinks um, called the, uh, the BAF, bitter as, which is uh, made, I think uses a half ounce of chocolate mole bitters from Bitterman's. You can, like, and also like these are all, these are all lovely, deep, brooding, complex spirits. They just, they're, they need to be balanced. If you're gonna use an ounce of Angostura. Remember, we used a full ounce of a super decadent, cloying syrup called Orgeat. You, there's no other drink that I would ever agree to drink that had an ounce of Orgeat in it. If you, if you told me one thing about a cocktail and you told me it had an ounce of Orgeat in it, I would say, that is diabetes. Ew. <laughs> that is not gonna taste good. Absolutely not. But not this, without an insulin shot. <laughs> Exactly. I need an insulin float on my cocktail, please. So it's about balancing it. It's about playing. It's about having fun. Um, uh, I think Marilyn is saying trying it with Angostura orange bitters. I wouldn't try this drink with Angostura orange bitters, but there are cocktails on the on the internet that uh, that use um, Regan's orange bitters. Shout out to Tom and Regan. That uh, that are really really nice. Um, I, I, I encourage you all to check it out. Uh, Demi was asking, why is this a tiki drink? It's a good question. So I would say this is as much a tiki drink as the planter's punch was a tiki drink, which it wasn't. Planters, the planter's punch preceded, it predated the tiki movement, right? The planter's punch was, was around for a long time, even if not by name. And this is a drink that uh, postdates the tiki movement. It's a drink that is informed by tiki. It has most of the things you're looking for. It has orgeat, which is a, is a tropical um, sort of exotic flavor profile. It has citrus. It certainly has spice. Uh, the only thing it's missing, like this drink were made with rum, you would think you would, you would have no second guesses about it. If you threw it in a tiki mug, you're good to go. But I would say that this drink does not exist without, um, you know, Trader Vic, Don the Beachcomber, the folks that are, are, are popularizing uh, these spices and juices and syrups in a way that had not been done so beforehand, before them, in the, before the 30s. So is it a tiki drink? It's tiki adjacent and maybe, maybe with modern considerations to what that word means, maybe it's just more of a tropical drink. And maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a back porch drink. Maybe it's a lake house drink. Maybe it's a, it's an, it's an escape drink. It's a, it's something to, to uh, kind of break up the daily grind kind of drink. Whatever word you use, it could be a, a gnome drink. I mean, if, if the, 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 if tiki as a culture is, 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 is really that far distant from what the actual drinks are, I mean, there's the, the, the culture, but the actual tikiness of it, is like not actually, I mean, if it's appropriate, then really anything, as long as you uh, 
you you believe that it is tropical and and it's a good flavorful tiki like drink might as well be as is yeah. as close in, uh, to that there was there was a, a really great piece if you go to punchdrink.com which is one of the blogs i, I frequent they've actually just happened to have a lot of um, a lot of discussions about tiki in the past and, and what's problematic about it um, it is a pretty liberal leaning um, point of view, which is I think important given that it's something we don't really talk about a whole lot anyways. But they discuss the fact that like, you know, it's, it, they wish that they could just use a different word. That they could just call it tropical, but then people wouldn't know what you're talking about. You need to use the word tiki to evoke the cocktails that we're discussing. I think of it like when I was taught like how you change a dog's name. If a dog's name is, is Ralph and you want to change its name to Thursday, you have to, you have to you have to call it Ralph Thursday over and over again so that it hears its old name and its new name. And then you can slowly start calling it just Thursday. Like you just, you need to use Tiki to tell people to call it tropical. And one, my, one last note on, on um, appropriation. Now that we're, now that we're in the Q and a section, we're, we're not going to put this in, right? We're just we're going to cut this part out. I'm, I'm not indigenous to anywhere except for, technically Malden, Massachusetts. But my father uh, was born in, in uh, outside Casablanca, Morocco. And I grew up knowing that, but not really having a whole lot of visuals about what, what a Moroccan looked like. And in fact, if I saw anybody with so much as a fez, it was usually a cartoon or a henchman from like a, like a, a, a B-side Bond film. Like it wasn't great. And uh, if you look at like the, the most famous movie that has Moroccans in it, uh, the Casablanca, there's actually no Moroccans in that movie. Not, not really. The main, the, main, the main dude is from New York City, okay? So it's, it's okay to, to borrow and to discuss other cultures, but if there's nothing else there, if you only know Hawaiians from Lilo and Stitch, if you only know Moroccans from Casablanca extras in the background, that's, that's where the issue comes in. And uh, that's, it, I, we know nothing about, I, I'll speak for myself, I, I know nothing about Bora Bora or Tahitians outside of what I've seen from a few episodes of the, 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 uh, the TV show Survivor, like watching reality TV. So I think it's the fact that um, what few representations there are that exist in, in, our, in our culture are, 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 are made to infantilize or to reduce um, or, to, or to make smaller. And, the, and that's, the, that's the problem. So, and this, I think this is all, it's all solved by traveling to these places in person. If you want to learn more about Tahiti, don't, drink, don't, don't order a Mai Tai. Go to, go to Tahiti. Learn about the problems there. Talk to somebody. Bring the stories back. Let, help, help us all learn. I mean, I think, you know, rate, you know, um, we could all we could all use a lot of information there. This is just coming from one white guy in in a in a white country, but I think we can we can all do better. We can all help each other. You should go over there, find a bar that's like says American bar with like you know the you know the flag on it and everything. Walk in there, see bald eagles everywhere. Like Dude. that that'll be the exact same experience. Go to yeah. if you go to Paris and you try and go to a burger joint. It is the most hilarious thing. Like they try to make like Johnny Rockets happen on the Champs Elysees, and they're using like palm fruit sauce. They're putting mayo on a burger, and they're not. And, and it's they don't. It's they don't know what they're doing. They admire the American aesthetic and the ideals and the and the and the food, but they can't do it. That's what we're. That's what we're doing. Uh, yeah. It, it, it. Bummer. We just have to be aware that we're doing it at times, but at yeah. the same time, you go to other countries and maybe maybe you have a, a a hamburger with some fries and you dip it in some whatever it is that they have instead of what you would normally have. Oh, and it's like it's called, hey, this is actually it's really good. The je ne sais quoi sauce. Ah, c'est bon. Uh, Will asked about bitters versus Underberg. Just a quick, it's a, it's a quick one. Underberg is meant to be drunk as a tiny little cute bottle. It is a, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's militarized bitterness that just breaks down the burger you had for breakfast. 
it is a it is a great people say that there's no such thing as a, as a silver bullet they're not they're they're wrong there is a silver bullet it's called underberg and if you uh, if you need to have a digestive if you want to really you know just break down uh the meal you had before that's a great way to do it um forget the pepto bismol go right for the underberg totally yeah yeah don't do it it's great but but would you use underberg in this drink instead of bitters would it do you think it would work it's not about bitterness it's not about alcohol content it's about flavor profile i haven't tried it though there are drinks that call for underberg out there um if you go to cocktail virgin blog and you type in underberg uh fred yarm of boston will have had a few cocktails excuse me made with underberg and they will they will make you feel things they are uh, they're absolutely lovely drinks um i don't have it off the top of my head i'm afraid but if you if you search cocktails made with underberg specifically cocktail virgin cocktail blog they will have some options there for you um try it out there's here the, also like there's no rules there's, there's another no- german one that I'm, I'm gonna type in here uh oh. it's called aromatique uh which honestly it, when i when i tried it and uh when i when i when i drink Agostura bitters i think they're very similar, but one's like more meant to be a liqueur and it's very, very sweet. I don't know if it would work in this sort of drink, but if you're looking for a liqueur that has a lot of baking spices in it, yeah, it has a little bit of anise in it, which, which, you know, may come out more in a drink like this, but that's okay. another one that I could think of if you're looking for something that is not bitters, but is a similar flavor. I'm just looking through the uh, the chat here, see if there's uh, anything, any other questions I should answer. Over in Harvard, they're asking, does Orjad need to be refrigerated once open? Yes. I say yes. Big yes. Uh, Steven is reporting that substituting Hamilton 151 Demerara rum and an egg white equals awesome. I, I love it. All power to you, man. This, I wanted to, uh, what, like, just like any other drink I've made, not just in the tiki classes, but in, in, the, in the cocktail challenge courses. I want to show you the platonic ideal of the cocktail, and you can mess with it as much as you want after that. And the fact that, it, it, that, that is crushing it for you, I'm going to make one um, as soon as I'm in a place that has things. Because I'm, I, 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 all I have are beautiful antique glasses that I do not deserve to drink out of, and strange <laughs> men with beards. As yeah, usual. just 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 toss the car keys over to uh, your friend over there and say, "Hey, go get me some. Uh, <laughs> go, go go pick up some more bitters for me." Um, are there any other questions out there, Phil? Before we before we wrap it up. Ah, good question. Do do do. I feel like we've satisfied pretty much everybody's curiosities so far. And if there are any other uh, curiosities that come up, be sure to email us uh, because we will we would love to uh, respond and, and with, with all kinds of information that we can't even say here. Uh, but if you have um, other questions and if you have pictures of your drinks, definitely send them to us because we want to we want to see the wonderful things that you're making. Uh, the uh, inspiration of this guy over here, and uh, we will definitely be posting them online. And uh, if, if anybody wants to join us on Thursday, by the way, if you, if you feel like going for round two, you want to make this drink again and then show off your, your wonderful experimentation. Between now and then, you got a lot of time to uh, play around with this drink. So uh, reach out to us. We would love to have you on the show. And uh, especially as in shows that, come, uh, that, that follow. Although uh, we, the next series probably will not be involving uh, cocktails, at least for, for a while. For a while. But uh, we would love to have you, uh, have anybody really uh, We're join excited. us, have some fun with it. Then if, if anyone has any thoughts on, on um, what the next series should be, we already have a few things lined up. But if there's anything that you've loved that you, that you think could use improvement, you guys are part of the process. You know, we're still very... Uh, early on in um, in you know our life cycle, but it means so much to us that you came out here. Um, shout out to my parents, love you, mom and dad. Thanks for coming. I know this is the only way that you can see me, <laughs> so it's nice to have you here. 
Um, I, uh, I have had an absolute blast. We hope to see you at the next series we have. We hope to see you tomorrow uh, for our, um, our interview with Reed Walker. And as always, um, you know, get ready for Armagnac season because oh, the yes. Amanda Sharon is coming at you real soon. That oh, is, this, uh, that this is, stuff is oh, good. Baby. Look at that zebra, that beautiful, Hell beautiful yeah. beast. That's a little right blurry on. there. Hold on. <laughs> zebra sauce is coming at you. That's, that's all I got to say. I uh, thank you. Thank you for, um, you know, giving me a little bit, a little bit of escape while I've been away from home. Uh, love you guys all. And uh, don't be strangers. We'll talk to you guys soon. Phil, cut that feed, baby. Cut the feed. Cut that feed. Cut that feed, babe. Cut it. Cut the feed. Cut the feed. Cut the feed. I need to, I need to make a feed. raft first. I have to build gonna, the raft. I'm going to cut my own feed, Phil. I'll do then it. I can get off the island and cut the feed. You're making me do this. I will do it, Phil. Don't. I, okay, I'll, hold on. Hold on. Me. Hold on. There's got to be a way to do this. Oh, cut, cut the feed. Wilson. I'm sorry. I'm sorry.